Welcome to a new episode from Perfect English Podcast. Today we're going to focus on listening again, but this time it's not going to be non-fiction. It is going to be fiction. I'm going to read a short story for you, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about the story. I have included a link that you can follow to read the story if you want and to find the possible answers that you may get from the questions I'm going to ask you. But remember, the questions I'm going to ask you do not have a one specific answer. I'm just going to put sample answers, possible answers to the questions because these are not going to be multiple choice questions or true-false like we did yesterday. So, let us start. The story is The Sniper by an Irish writer called Liam O'Flaherty. Now, before I start reading the story to you, let me give you a little background of the story so when you hear the story, you'll understand better what we're talking about. Now, the story is set in Dublin, Ireland in the 1920s during a time of bitter civil war. On one side were the Republicans. They wanted all of Ireland to become a republic totally free from British rule. On the other side were the Free Staters. They had compromised with Britain and had agreed to allow the English to continue to rule six counties in the northern province of Ulster. Like all civil wars, this one tore families apart. It pitted children against parents, sister against sister, brother against brother. As the story opens, the writer immediately puts us into the war, high on a Dublin rooftop. The Sniper by Liam O'Flaherty The long June twilight faded into night. Dublin lay enveloped in darkness, but for the dim light of the moon that shone through fleecy clouds, casting a pale light as approaching dawn over the streets and the dark waters of the Liffey, around the beleaguered four courts, the heavy guns roared. Here and there through the city, machine guns and rifles broke the silence of the night, spasmodically like dogs barking on lone farms. Republicans and free staters were waging civil war. On a rooftop near O'Connell Bridge, a Republican sniper lay watching. Beside him lay his rifle, and over his shoulder was slung a pair of field glasses. His face was the face of a student, thin and ascetic, but... His eyes had the cold gleam of the fanatic. They were deep and thoughtful, the eyes of a man who is used to looking at death. He was eating a sandwich hungrily. He had eaten nothing since morning. He had been too excited to eat. He finished the sandwich and, taking a flask of whiskey from his pocket, he took a short draft. Then he returned the flask to his pocket. He paused for a moment, considering whether he should risk a smoke. It was dangerous. The flash might be seen in the darkness and there were enemies watching. He decided to take the risk. Placing a cigarette between his lips, he struck a match, inhaled the smoke hurriedly and put out the light. Almost immediately, a bullet flattened itself against the parapet of the roof. The sniper took another whiff and put out the cigarette. Then he swore softly and crawled away to the left. Cautiously, he raised himself and peered over the parapet. There was a flash and a bullet whizzed over his head. He dropped immediately. He had seen the flash. It came from the opposite side of the street. He rolled over the roof to a chimney stack in the near and slowly drew himself up behind it, until his eyes were level with the top of the parapet. There was nothing to be seen, just a dim outline of the opposite housetop against the blue sky. His enemy was undercover. Just then an armored car came across the bridge and advanced slowly up the street. It stopped on the opposite side of the street 50 yards ahead. The sniper could hear the dull panting of the motor. His heart beat faster. It was an enemy car. He wanted to fire but he knew it was useless. His bullets would never pierce the steel that covered the gray monster. Then round the corner of a side street came an old woman, her head covered by a tattered shawl. She began to talk to the man in the turret of the car. She was pointing to the roof where the sniper lay, an informer. The turret opened. A man's head and shoulders appeared, looking toward the sniper. The sniper raised his rifle and fired. The head fell heavily on the turret wall. The woman darted toward the side street. The sniper fired again. The woman whirled round and fell with a shriek into the gutter. 
Suddenly from the opposite roof a shot rang out and the sniper dropped his rifle with a curse. The rifle clattered to the roof. The sniper thought the noise would wake the dead. He stopped to pick his rifle up. He couldn't lift it. His forearm was dead. I'm hit, he muttered. Dropping flat onto the roof, he crawled back to the parapet. With his left hand, he felt the injured right forearm. The blood was oozing through the sleeve of his coat. There was no pain, just a deadened sensation, as if the arm had been cut off. Quickly, he drew his knife from his pocket, opened it on the breastwork of the parapet, and ripped open the sleeve. There was a small hole where the bullet had entered. On the other side, there was no hole. The bullet had lodged in the bone. It must have fractured it. He bent the arm below the wound. The arm bent back easily. He ground his teeth to overcome the pain. Then taking out his field dressing, he ripped open the packet with his knife. He broke the neck of the iodine bottle and let the bitter fluid drip into the wound. A paroxysm of pain swept through him. He placed the cotton wadding over the wound and wrapped the dressing over it. He tied the ends with his teeth. Then he lay still against the parapet, and closing his eyes, he made an effort of will to overcome the pain. In the street beneath, all was still. The armored car had retired speedily over the bridge, with the machine gunner's head hanging lifeless over the turret. The woman's corpse lay still in the gutter. The sniper lay still for a long time, nursing his wounded arm and planning escape. Morning must not find him wounded on the roof. The enemy on the opposite roof covered his escape. He must kill that enemy, and he could not use his rifle. He had only a revolver to do it. Then he thought of a plan. Taking off his cap, he placed it over the muzzle of his rifle. Then he pushed the rifle slowly upward over the parapet, until the cap was visible from the opposite side of the street. Almost immediately there was a report and a bullet pierced the center of the cap. The sniper slanted the rifle forward. The cap slipped down into the street. Then catching the rifle in the middle, the sniper dropped his left hand over the roof and let it hang lifelessly. After a few moments, he let the rifle drop to the street. Then he sank to the roof, dragging his hand with him. Crawling quickly to the left, he peered up at the corner of the roof. His ruse had succeeded. The other sniper, seeing the cap and rifle fall, thought that he had killed his man. He was now standing before a row of chimney pots, looking across with his head clearly silhouetted against the western sky. The Republican sniper smiled and lifted his revolver above the edge of the parapet. The distance was about 50 yards, a hard shot in the dim light, and his right arm was paining him like a thousand devils. He took a steady aim, his hand trembled with eagerness. Pressing his lips together, he took a deep breath through his nostrils and fired. He was almost deafened with the report and his arm shook with the recoil. Then when the smoke cleared, he peered across and uttered a cry of joy. His enemy had been hit. He was reeling over the parapet in his death agony. He struggled to keep his feet, but he was slowly falling forward as if in a dream. The rifle fell from his grasp, hit the parapet, fell over, bounded off the pole of a barber's shop beneath, and then clattered on the pavement. Then the dying man on the roof crumpled up and fell forward. The body turned over and over in space and hit the ground with a dull thud, then it lay still. The sniper looked at his enemy falling, and he shuddered. The lust of battle died in him. He became bitten with remorse. The sweat stood out in beads on his forehead. Weakened by his wound and the long summer day of fasting and watching on the roof, he revolted from the sight of the shattered mass of his dead enemy. His teeth chattered. He began to gibber to himself, cursing the war, cursing himself, cursing everybody. He looked at the smoking revolver in his hand, and with an oath he hurled it to the roof at his feet. The revolver went off with a concussion, and the bullet whizzed past the sniper's head. He was frightened back to his senses by the shock. His nerves steadied, the cloud of fear scattered from his mind, and he laughed. Taking the whiskey flask from his pocket, he emptied it at a draft. He felt reckless under the influence of the spirit. 
He decided to leave the roof now and look for his company commander to report. Everywhere around was quiet. There was not much danger in going through the streets. He picked up his revolver and put it in his pocket. Then he crawled down through the skylight to the house underneath. When the sniper reached the laneway on the street level, he felt a sudden curiosity as to the identity of the enemy sniper whom he had killed. He decided that he was a good shot, whoever he was. He wondered, did he know him? Perhaps he had been in his own company before the split in the army. He decided to risk going over to have a look at him. He peered around the corner into O'Connell Street. In the upper part of the street there was heavy firing, but around here all was quiet. The sniper darted across the street. A machine gun tore up the ground around him with a hail of bullets, but he escaped. He threw himself face downward beside the corpse. The machine gun stopped. Then the sniper turned over the dead body and looked into his brother's face. I must admit this is a tragic story. It's not the kind of story where you have a happy ending. But so is civil war everywhere. This depiction of civil war is not different from any civil war or any war we find anywhere around the world today. It's pretty much the same. Nothing good comes out of war, no matter what kind it is, no matter what cause you're fighting for. It's not worth it. But anyway, as I promised, I'm going to ask some questions and I want to leave these questions to you. Think about the answers. You may want to listen again to the story to come up with the answers. And this time, I'm not going to give you multiple choice questions or true and false. I'm going to give you questions where you need to write or at least think and talk about them. And to help you know whether your answers are right or wrong, I'm including a link. It will take you to a page where you can read the story, see all the questions I'm going to ask you with sample answers. And I'm saying that they are sample answers because I don't want you to think that you are wrong. You just need to get the main idea of the answer, not exactly what I write. I will write sample answers. You just compare your answers to the answers you find on the page. And now for the questions. I will start with my first question. Why does the sniper kill the old woman? And what happens to him after he fires his weapon? So again, why does the sniper kill the old woman? And what happens to him after he fires his weapon? The second question. What does the sniper do to trick his enemy? What does the sniper do to trick his enemy? And the third question. What discovery does the sniper make at the end of the story? What discovery does the sniper make at the end of the story? And now for question number four. What facts are we told directly about the sniper? What can you infer about his character? So what facts are we told directly about the sniper? Or what can you infer about his character? And now for the next question. How do you think O'Flaherty wants the reader to view the sniper? Is he a cold-blooded killer, a soldier doing his duty, or a man caught in a tragic situation? How do the sniper's actions change your opinion of him at various moments in the story? So I will repeat this question, this long question again. How do you think O'Flaherty wants the reader to view the sniper? Is he a cold-blooded killer, a soldier doing his duty, or a man caught in a tragic situation? How do the sniper's actions change your opinion of him at various moments of the story? And the last question for the story. This story revolves around an external conflict, the sniper's life or death struggle. Explain the internal conflict the sniper also faces. How is his internal conflict resolved? So, one more time. The story revolves around an external conflict, the sniper's life or death struggle. Explain the internal conflict the sniper also faces. How is his internal conflict resolved? And that will be all for today's episode. I hope you have enjoyed the story and I hope you try to answer the questions. I must admit, not all of them are easy and straightforward. Some of them might require you to listen again to the story or maybe take the link and read it. But trust me, it's worth it. And you learn English not only from learning new vocabulary, new grammar etc. No, you learn English from reading good stories and thinking about these stories, reflecting on these stories. That will help your English become a lot better. So that'll be all for today. This is your host, Danny, saying thank you very much for listening to yet another episode from Perfect English Podcast. Don't forget, 
tomorrow is the start of a new week and we start a new week with a vocabulary episode. So don't miss that episode. I will see you tomorrow in the episode where we're going to learn about more vocabulary. Thank you very much. Thank you.